Thank you for tuning in to Aster Investment Management's podcast series. This week, our Chief Investment Officer, John Eckstein, and Senior Managing Director, Mac O'Brien, discuss the current economic outlook in the era of COVID-19. Thank you both for joining us today. So hello and welcome back to another edition of Aster's Economic Week in Review with myself, Mac O'Brien. And again, joining me today is Aster's Chief Investment Officer, John Eckstein. John, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Mac? I'm doing fantastic. And Sabila, thank you for the introduction. Today, John, or I guess over the past several days, we had four data points. Job openings or the JOLTS survey, jobless claims, again, of course, PPI, consumer sentiment, and the CPI. So I guess five data points. And similar theme from last week, John, we're not going to really spend too much time talking about the data points that don't factor in the impact of COVID-19 because those data points were from the month prior and it's kind of irrelevant at this point, right? Yep. So let's just start with jobless claims. Same spot we started last week. John, we had another six some odd million people file for unemployment over the past week. That's on top of 10 million people that already, I think the total number is 17 million in the past three weeks. Does it matter at this point, to be honest, the number? I mean, sure. It does and it doesn't. Like, we know it's really, really bad. Like, we know that the unemployment rate is probably 10, 15%, probably going to be worse on record once they measure it. You know, we need to know when it stops sort of uh, going down. But is it, it, we wouldn't have, be having a different discussion. It was only 5 million instead of 6.6 million today. Right. Like, and the expectations are currently for claims to continue to increase, for more people to file for unemployment insurance insurance because there's still uh, anecdotal reports that the system is still gummed up, right? That people, not everybody who is eligible has been able to apply yet. Well, I know that for a fact, right? So I've, I've heard firsthand accounts of people in Illinois. Did that, your wife ever be able to be able to figure out? Yeah. So my wife owns a small photography company and uh, she's an independent contractor. So we're going through the process of trying to figure out Illinois is not yet able to process claims from independent contractors or sole proprietorships. I think there's a whole slew of people out there that qualify under the, the new COVID guidelines, but can't even file right now or essentially are out of work, right? With no income, having expenses to run that business. Right. Um, and just, just so people know, like a lot of times there's restrictions restrictions on who can file for unemployment insurance. So most of the time, if you're self-employed, you cannot. You cannot. That's correct. And so as part of the so-called CARES Act, and I think as part of the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, Mm -hmm. um, they are allowing some people who are not normally able to apply or are allowed to apply now. That's right. It's still gummed up. Phone lines just hang up on you. The online portal is hard to navigate. So you're right. I think that we will see, I mean, last week you mentioned 25 million or so unemployment claims throughout the entire 2008 financial crisis. And we're at probably around 25 right now. If you really factor in everyone that needs to file and can't at the moment, you know, in three or four weeks, we probably equaled the entire jobless claims. But that's not the real story, right? The real story is how many jobs are simply on pause and how many jobs are going to come back. Do you have any new insights from anything that you've thought of or read over the past week in terms of how slow, for that matter, the economy will, will start getting back to work? Yeah, so I think there is a consensus coalescing around what needs to happen before people are going to be starting gathering groups again, right? Which is sort of the definition of an economy, like people getting together in groups and doing stuff. One of those is to be sort of past the peak of the spread and hot spots. Another is about the widespread testing availability and a plan to track people who are newly infected. That seems to be the plan that you're hearing coalesce. We don't have any real information about the testing protocol and the tracing contact of people who test positive. That's the big mystery right now. But it just, I know Illinois was just extended till the end of April, right? Yeah. New York was just extended to the end of April. John, so we have very timely data with jobless claims to get a picture of the impact, at least a picture, right? Whether it's fully accurate or not, a picture of what's happening with the employment situation in the United States on the way up, right? So once we do hit peak and people start coming back to work and those jobs that were furloughed are now coming back, because jobless claims are so quick. We get it every week. States give visibility. Payrolls come out once a month. What data point are we going to be looking at very closely to see how the situation thaws out and people get back to work? So there's a bunch of data that we can look at. 
you know, and data that's sort of more familiar, I would say uh, we've talked about survey data in the past, and that can be fairly current. There are weekly, even daily surveys of economic sentiment. So we saw some survey data released last week that was negative, as you might expect, right? So University of Michigan came out negative, and, uh, which is a, a monthly survey, but they release a preliminary release halfway through the month. So now you're talking about consumer sentiment, right? Right. Yeah, so consumer sentiment, I'm looking at my peculiar screen for the listeners. It's University of Michigan, uh, 600 households are surveyed each month on their financial conditions, attitudes about the economy, et cetera, right? And it's a very important survey that gives economists and the public an idea of what the general consumer is thinking, which in this economic expansion for the past three or four or five years, at least past 10, 11 years, has been really on the back of the strong confidence of the consumer. So sorry yeah. to interrupt you, John, keep on going there. That's correct. The consumer has been carrying the uh, the economy. So those readings sort of fell off a cliff, as you might expect. There's several different surveys. One of the charts that we have on the website tries to take a bunch of different surveys and extract sort of a common trend out of them. And so you, you can check, Matt will give you that information at the end of the podcast. Consumer sentiment is falling quickly. And so that'll be something that you can watch stabilize, then turn around. Yeah. And um, so just for the listeners that are you know, number geeks, the index, the consumer sentiment index fell more than 18 points from March, which together with the monthly 10 point decline two months ago, made it the largest two months drop on record. And the current conditions fell more than 30 points to nearly double the prior record set in October of 2008. So just like d jobless claims are setting records, it makes sense that consumer sentiment is setting records for the severity of the decline and the speed at which it's declining. Right. And there's other ways to measure consumer sentiment too. So like there's a small business optimism survey, which got clobbered in March. There's Bloomberg conducts weekly surveys. It got clobbered last week. Everything's telling the same story. And so, you know, when we're looking at the economy in general, we've got a bunch of different sort of noisy measurements and we're trying to use all these different measurements to try and get a sense of what's going on. So that's going to be important when we're trying to figure out when we hit bottom and when we come out of it. You know, there's a series of weekly indicators which we've been looking at. You know, we might try to get those up on the website if people are interested in, in looking at them. What are they, John? What type of weekly indicators are they? Some of them are those high frequency consumer sentiment indicators. There's retail sales indicator, likely how many people are going to stores. There's staffing companies. You know, if you're hiring a receptionist, you might want to hire a staffing company to send you a receptionist instead of hiring someone on your own. So those staffing companies get together and put out weekly weekly those and yeah, very interesting. And for the listeners, I hope you get those on the website. I'll follow up with that after this podcast. But uh, the link for our charts that just goes over the economic data is asterim.com backslash charge. John, moving on to the other data points, CPI came out and CPI got pretty hammered as expected in terms of prices. And, you know, energy fell drastically, an increase in, in medical services. But do you have any comments on the CPI before we move past it? No, I mean, I think that with the CPI, we're going to be sort of in wait and see mode. There's going to be a lot of really strange things happening in terms of energy, as you pointed out. What we're doing is unprecedented, right? Not just the economy falling off the cliff, but everybody staying home for a few months. So, and a stimulus package on top of all that, right? That pushes And a stimulus out. package on top of all that, that's not going to kick in for a while. So for example, a lot of the food you used to consume used to go through the sort of wholesale channel. The food is packaged differently and sold to schools and concert halls or whatever, where we used to eat restaurants. Milk is scarce in the supermarket, but dairy farmers are actually dumping milk down the drain because they don't have the capacity to put it in the cartons and get Get it to the supermarkets, right? Because they're used to 50% of the milk capacity going to industrial uses, going and end, ending up either in packaged in huge 50 gallon drums or sent right to the factories, whatever. You know, the prices of milk and eggs are going up even though there's plenty of physical stuff around. And interesting. I think things are gonna be strange for a while. God knows like what's going on in the medical supply too. Right. right? And the PPI, I'm not trying to jump too much, taking yep. this time to consider ratio. PPI is the same story in terms of uh, prices. I'm going through our list. Jobless claims we touched upon, jolts. Jolts next month will be very interesting. It will. So the pattern that you saw in the global financial crisis with jolts, not so much. I mean, hiring, firings went up a little bit, but hirings went down a lot mm. um, is the pattern that I see in the 
jolts during the recession. So I, I'm certain we're going to see that. And, I, and I, for evidence, I would say like we can look at the uh, payroll number, which had a huge drop, but that was before data was before when the uh, when jobless claims. Yeah, right. Well, before people started getting laid off. And so that's telling me, <clears throat> even as COVID was just sort of on the horizon, businesses were being cautious and not hiring as many people as they would in a typical month. So we'll, yeah. we'll see that in the, in the jolts number. Let's talk about inflation for one second. I think I'm not going to be interested in inflation until until we're sort of in the recovery phase of things, right? No one, the central bank isn't going to be, if the Fed isn't interested in inflation, neither am I, right? And they're not going to be interested in inflation until we seem to have, a, seem to be getting up off the floor. Yeah. We did a podcast with Rob Stein, our CEO and founder for the listeners yesterday, the Fed stimulus package inflation. Rob kind of went over the, the definition. It's not traditional inflation, like there's a money supply. It's it can be a whole different ball game over the next 18 to you know 36 months on how the stimulus package hits the economy and pushes prices up or, or rather it causes inflation. So a lot to watch over uh, the short term and long term in terms of economic fundamentals. Yeah, there's going to be plenty to keep us. Keep us. <laughs> so next week, John, I'm going to leave it with this. We have retail sales, industrial production, housing starts, jobless claims, and leading indicators. Minus jobless claims, what data point are you going to be most interested to see next week out of those five? I think that those are not going to be interesting. Because I think what you want to be talking about next week, so you also start to have, you're going to start to have a few surveys coming out next week, Empire Manufacturing Survey and the Philadelphia Fed Business Outlook. So those are things that are for April. Those will be more interesting. Also, like the housing market index will be out next week and that'll be an April number. So we want to be looking at the more timely stuff. So definitely claims any of these higher frequency series that mentioning. All right. And for the listeners, again, if you go to our charts page on our website, you can see that our Aster Economic Index, which was co-founded by John and Rob, it has declined quite significantly as a result of various economic data points that we pay close attention to deteriorating. So that is kind of the, the Aster Economic Index is Aster's big picture temperature gauge of the U.S. economy. It's what John and the team uses to manage money. So John, uh, it's awesome having you on this. I look forward to next week. Listeners, thank you for tuning in. Uh, We're trying to give you the most concise, valuable information on economic fundamentals as we can. Uh, We consider ourselves an expert in our little silo of analyzing, understanding, collecting economic data. Any questions or comments you have on the podcast, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. Have a great long weekend. John, see ya. Thanks, Mac. We'll see you soon. To learn more about Aster Investment Management's research and strategies, please visit us on the web at www.asteriam.com or stay up to date by following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and our app is also available on the App Store and Google Play. Thank you. Aster Investment Management LLC is a SEC registered investment advisor. All information contained herein is for informational purposes only. This is not a solicitation to offer investment advice or services at any state where to do so would be unlawful. Analysis and research are provided for informational purposes only, not for trading or investing purposes. All opinions expressed are as of the date of publication and subject to change. They are not intended as investment recommendations.